on today's show. Looking back on my life, I see him everywhere. His fingerprints were everywhere the whole time, which really helps me wrap my mind around his love, too. That even though I felt alone, even though there's been times where I had suicidal thoughts, all those different things, he was there. Every moment of it, he was there. Welcome to the 700 Club Canada. I'm Lori Hartshorn. And I'm Brian Warren, and we're excited that you've joined us today. Tell me if any of these sound familiar. It's too late anyways. Uh, I don't deserve this. I don't have what it takes. Well, I think we've all believed certain lies about ourselves like those, right? Mm -hmm. These patterns of thinking, they can become strongholds and sabotage our lives without us even realizing it. So like believing lies, Brian, how would you tell people, like, how would people identify a lie? And that's a funny, uh, funny thing, because the, 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 the power of a lie is that it is so close to the truth. Mm. I mean, I remember there was this story about a, uh, a man one day, and uh, he was out, and he said, it's a wonderful day, I'm going to take off my clothes and just go for a dip. And uh, someone took his clothes. And they put him on, and they ran into town, and they he thought was it was stuck. him. Yeah, oh. but it was a lie dressed up in the truth's clothes, mm. and everybody thought on the surface that it was the truth, but everyone knew the sound of it just did not pass the sniff I'm test. I'm still stuck with the guy naked in the pool back oh, come there. On. You know, well, like not, okay, well, somebody's on. wearing his clothes. I get your point. <laughs> I do. I do. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? To your point. Lies are deceiving. Sure they are. They're like, half-truths. They're half-truths, and sometimes you don't even know you're believing a lie. Can I just say, one of the ways I know whether something's true yeah. or not true, it's the scripture. And when you, this is one of the reasons God gave us yeah. his word, because it actually reveals the truth, yeah. and then when you know the truth, then you know what is the lie. You're right. And the more that you get to know the truth teller, then you know when the liar is speaking to you. So it's yeah. through relationship with God. It's through being in his word, yeah. right? And the way you find a counterfeit is you just continue to look at the article, yeah, right. the authentic article. That's right. You know, today you'll learn how to break free from those lies and live your best life. And we have a positive message just for you during Hope to Go coming up a bit later in the program. But first, Major League Baseball pitcher Kyle Gibson's formula for success in baseball and in life. Watch. Hope he keeps his clothes on. Kyle Gibson doesn't just make his pitch. The Minnesota Twins starting pitcher targets the game inside the game, arming his heart, mind, and emotion while the six-year veteran takes the stage in baseball's performance-based business. From the time where uh, I'm sitting in my locker when I'm listening to, to worship music, honestly, and really trying to make sure that my heart's in the right spot, I always feel like that that circle out there, it's not who I am, it's just part of what I'm here to do. And I'm gonna face a lot of situations throughout the game that if my heart's not in the right spot, the decision I make is probably gonna be a bad decision. What you said for what you might face, do I then presume that that's anxiety? Sure. Is that fear? It's all the above, you know, it, uh, it's a stressful situation where if you're not prepared for it, you could make the wrong decision pitch-wise. It could be, you know, maybe you have to show grace after an error in the field or you have to you know, show a little bit of humility after a home run. You just want to make sure that your mind and heart's in the right spot. Next to the arm, what is the most critical component to be a successful starting pitcher? <sighs> if you talk to 10 people, you might get 10 different answers. You know, I think the legs are important. I think, you know, the torso is important. Over the last year and a half, I really kind of feel like uh, the mind is probably the next important thing. You know, you can feel as good as you want, but if you get that mind right, it just changes everything. You can have the confidence behind what you're doing, and if, if I don't have the confidence in the pitch that I'm going to be throwing, uh, I might as well not throw it. What do you think would surprise us the most? How sometimes it's difficult to handle situations that you can't control. In this park in the summer, obviously you can't control which way uh, the wind is blowing. Uh, and sometimes a routine fly ball to right becomes a home run, and sometimes a uh, home run to left becomes a routine fly ball. So once you throw the ball, you can't control if that umpire misses the call or gives you a call. Being able to, to handle those situations constantly that you have no control over is pretty tough. Has that been helpful for you in your Christ following? In times, I think it's just like a lot of things in life, the more you practice it, the better you get at it. 
You know, it's really my love from Christ that helps me in those other situations. It's the grace that he's given me that allows me to hopefully show grace most of the time on the mound and do that in my relationship, you know, versus practicing that on the mound and taking it home. And as soon as you release that ball, there is that surrender. Yeah, you have to be able to be okay sometimes with results that aren't mm -hmm. what you planned on. And one of them is you can easily get caught up in numbers in this game. And it's easy to look at yourself as an ERA or a strikeout total and kind of determine your worth. How have you been freed from that? Oh, wow, that's a good question. One of the lies that, you know, uh, has been tough for me to get rid of, but I've had to get rid of is I can't think of myself as an ERA or even a jersey number or anything like that because it's just a lie. My identity is in Christ, and that's really my identity. You have to be able to leave those lies behind um, because the more you start believing in those lies, the less you're going to believe in the actual truths about yourself. What is the Christ follower and the elite competitor have in common? I think they can have everything in common. Paul is one of my favorite guys to read uh, from the Bible just because of everything he went through. And he talked multiple times about running the race and everybody that runs the race is supposed to run to win. You complete it as if you're completing a task from God. There was a couple of times where I started showing a little bit more emotion on the field. And one talk that I had with you know, our GM and uh, another one of our front office, and, and they said, listen, we know that you're a man of faith and those things don't have to separate. I think they're as intertwined as you want them to be. You know, walk off the mound and do everything with as much love as possible. And sometimes having that little competitive edge isn't a bad thing. Got to get you a tearaway jersey. Yeah, that's right. right. <laughs> That'd go that's over right. well. <laughs> Possibly not, but I like <laughs> it. Possibly not. I have a lot of explaining to do. I've noticed when you sign, you will add a scripture. What is that scripture and why? It's Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. There's good of representation of the gospel and what I'm really trying to do in life as I found. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, not of works, so that no one can boast. It's a gift from God. We are God's handiwork, mm -hmm. created by Him to do the good works that He set out in advance for us to do. This is what I'm here to do. You know, I'm, I've been put here to put this verse and, and to do the work that God set out in advance for me to do. You know, one of the funny statements that I heard in there, I started to show a little bit of emotion and uh, the front office was telling me, you know what, uh, we know you're a man of faith. Uh, you don't have to, there, you don't have to separate the two. Mm. And, uh, you know, when I, I, I look at professional athletics, one of the things that I do see so many times, we are disassociating, you know, we're living a life and other mm. people are living a life as well. But it's really tough when you're a major league pitcher. Mm. And your uh, identity's caught so much in performance and the number and correct. the success. Yes. Yeah, you know, this story reminded me of that scripture verse from Hebrews 12, you know, yes. which is true for all of us, because it actually scripture says we're all athletes. Yeah. And and it says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that easily entangles. And let's run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the perfecter of our faith. You know, when we live our life in such a way that we're not identified by our successes yeah. or our failures, we look at Jesus and we respond to the truth. Who does Jesus say that we really are? Yeah. That is the only race worth running. You're absolutely right. And I, and I love what, what Kyle said. He said, I can't think of myself as an ERA or even a jersey number, yeah. but I have to see myself as Christ sees me. And that's really about our identity. You know, you're not what you do, you're whose you belong to. And I think that's so critical for us to get across because otherwise these labels just continue to hold us in a box and they make us and they toward us in the things that God never created us to be. Absolutely. I think the issue of identity is critical to our freedom. So mm -hmm. if you're struggling right today with who are who does God say you are, call us. There's someone right there on the phone ready to pray with you and give you the truth of who Jesus says you are. Yeah. Well, up next, Natasha is set free from a lifetime of believing the lies. You'll see how the truth changed her life forever. Pretty cool.
Natasha Grants always wanted to belong, the child of a biracial affair between two married people. Natasha was put up for adoption at seven months old. It was difficult being adopted and trying to channel all the emotions that I felt. My biological mother did not want to take care of me. I think I was a reminder of her affair and she struggled with that as well as my race. My white friends would tell me I acted too black and my black friends would tell me I acted too white. So it was really difficult trying to find my identity. Natasha's identity issues and insecurities made her lash out at those around her. I did have a lot of anger issues and a lot of emotional problems, I guess you could say, that I did take out on my adoptive mother, I think, so she got the brunt of it for the most part. Natasha still craved approval, so she started having sex when she was just 12 years old. You know, I didn't understand my body. I didn't understand you know, how to value it and what it meant and who I was. I started at a very young age, and I was very promiscuous from that point forward. Every guy I would date, I automatically had it in my mind that I had to do these things in order to stay with him. She drifted from relationship to relationship, looking for fulfillment. I really felt that I didn't have any purpose. I wasn't sure of what goals to even set if I did have any. I just kind of felt lost and alone, and I wasn't sure what I was on this earth for. Then she got pregnant at 15 by her 19-year-old boyfriend. I felt completely numb being pregnant in 15. I was just numb to it. And as the pregnancy progressed, I did feel like being a mother would become my identity, and I would finally find myself in that. But halfway through her pregnancy, her baby's father was shot and killed. Natasha was lost again and slipped into a deep depression. Suddenly, everything was stripped away. My world was turned upside down, and I realized that I wasn't in control of anything because I think I believed the illusion that everything was in my control and that no matter what came at me, everything was going to be okay. Her adoptive mother helped Natasha through the depression of losing her baby's father, and the two became close. After her son was born, Natasha tried to make motherhood her purpose. She returned to finish high school and then started community college but she still felt incomplete. Even though I felt like I was coming into my identity as a mother, I was still empty inside. I still felt like I was missing something greater, something bigger, and um, I couldn't figure it out, doing what I was supposed to do, but I was still like a zombie. There was no life inside of me. I didn't have life. I just went along with what I thought I was supposed to do, and I was trying to be the kind of mother I thought I was supposed to be. During her second year of college, Natasha noticed something different about one of her professors. There was something about him that was intriguing me, and just the way he conducted himself. It was the little things, and I've never been around anybody like that. One day at the end of the semester, she asked him about it. And his reply was, I'm a warrior of Jesus Christ. He never mentioned Jesus' name in class, never said anything like that, but the presence was so strong that I could still feel it, and I still knew. They talked for a while, and the professor invited her to church. I've never been to church besides for Christmas and Easter, you know, not even every Christmas and Easter. I have always felt drawn to the spiritual world, but I would look to fill that void in things like a Ouija board or hanging out with my friends in a cemetery. I just had that hunger for something deeper. At church, Natasha felt God's love, and she knew she found what was missing from her life. There was something, a chord that was struck in me where I knew that this stuff was real and something in me just lit up and went crazy. When I got home from church, I prayed. I went to my bedroom, closed the door and prayed on my knees and said, Jesus, please come into my heart. And instantly it was like a light bulb came on. That's what it felt like. I'm finally home and God just became my father. And there was this beautiful connection that was so deep. It was indescribable. I saw myself as having an identity in him now. It wasn't just up to me and who I saw in the mirror. It was about so much more. He looked at me and he saw a beautiful daughter of his that could change the world with his help, you know, as he worked through me. And I saw myself of great value. You know, I wasn't just this little biracial girl that was swayed to and from, adopted and unwanted. I became this powerful woman and um, he just overtook my heart and everything. The first thing she did was buy a Bible. She would read it constantly. I just was completely soaking up all the truth I could. I just loved that thing, and I didn't even understand it, but I knew I was meant to be reading it. Today, she is happily married to a pastor, and they are planning a church outside of Pittsburgh. She identifies as a child of God, 
unconditionally loved and forgiven. Looking back on my life, I see him everywhere. His fingerprints were everywhere the whole time, which really helps me wrap my mind around his love, too. And even though I felt alone, even though there's been times where I had suicidal thoughts, all those different things, he was there. Every moment of it, he was there. To sit here and see the big picture of what he's done since the moment I was adopted up until now, and the people he's brought in and out of my life and everything, it's just, I don't know. You just really wrap your mind around how good he is and how much you really don't deserve any of it. Natasha was just looking to belong, looking to fit in. She struggled so much with identity issues. And this often is the pattern and the cycle that can lead any of us into wrong choices. But I just love this beautiful story of redemption and healing in her life. And this is what Natasha said. Looking back on my life, I see him everywhere. His fingerprints were everywhere the whole time, which really helped me wrap my mind around his love for me. You know, even when she was contemplating suicide, she recognized that God was with her. Can I just tell you today, I don't know what it is that you're going through, but you are deeply loved. You are deeply loved by God. He wants to have a relationship with you. He is there with you. It may be ugly for you right now. You may be struggling. There may even be suicidal thoughts. The gospel says that God so loved the world and that means every one of us, that whoever believes in what Jesus did on the cross will have eternal life. Will you receive God's love today? Pray with me right now. Just say, Jesus, I'm, I'm ashamed of, of what I've done and what's been done to me, but I just come to you and I lay all of that at your feet. I want to belong. I want to belong to you. I receive your love. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I receive your forgiveness, come into my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you know that prayer leads you into relationship with God because he loves you. He sees you that you have purpose. He has a plan for you. God creates us, each one of us, with purpose. And that's what gives us great freedom in our life. One of my favorite verses is Psalm 57, 2. It says, I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. So your first step in your purpose is to come into relationship with God. And if you prayed that prayer with me, I want you to call the number on the screen, 1-855-759-0700. Ask for the resource, ask for someone to pray with you, and then walk in the purposes that God has for you today, knowing you're deeply loved. We'll be right back with more Hope to Go with Brian. Too often we carry baggage from our past. You know what it's like. It affects everything and everyone in our lives. It's always there, weighing us down and keeping us from achieving true happiness. But do you know God never meant for us to be trapped in the past? You can be free of your baggage. Learn how God's forgiveness leads to changed lives and new beginnings. Call the 700 Club. Welcome to this Hope to Go. Today I want to talk to you about don't buy the lie. God has a beautiful plan for every life. We recognize it as destiny. Ephesians 1.5, it says this, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure. Did you hear that? In advance, predetermined destiny. Destiny is a word that encompasses the predestination of God for our lives. Now, some people debate predestination, but the Bible is full of this truth. God predetermined that through Abraham, he would bless all the nations of the world. God predetermined for Jesus to die for the sins of the world and to restore what Adam lost. God is a God of destiny and purpose. Everything about God's dealings with man is connected with purpose. Listen to the prophet Jeremiah in the 29th chapter. The New Living Translation says, For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days, when you pray, I will listen. 
If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. Don't buy the lie that God is not good and God is against you and you've messed up too much and oh yeah, God doesn't have a good plan for me. In this hope to go, don't buy the lie, take home truth. I wanna give you three things that you need in order to leave the lies. Number one, get to know God. Jeremiah 1, 5 says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and I appointed you as my prophet to the nations. Get to know God. Who is God? How God works and his general will for people are spelled out in the accounts and the teachings of the Bible. Ask yourself, do I interact with the word of God in some way every day to know God's heart? Now, the Bible is God's love letter to you. John 6, 63, it says it this way, the spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Don't buy the lie, I can't be God's friend. And number two, stay on talking terms with God. Matthew 7, 7, it says this, keep on asking and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. Prayer is simply conversing with God. People tell me, Pastor, I don't know how to pray. I ask, do you know how to talk? Obviously. So talk with God in your own words, discussing the issues of your life. Don't buy the lie, I'm bothering God. And three, pursue godly counsel and wise friends. Proverbs 27, 17 says, iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. The myth, the superhero, the lone ranger does not apply to the Christian life. I need you and you need me and we all need each other. God's will is sharpened as we share life with with others and become authentic, talking through our fears, our doubts, and even our arrogant assumptions. Don't buy the lie, I'm a lone ranger. And four and finally, recognize God moments. Isaiah 45 and 15 says, truly, O God of Israel, our savior, you work in mysterious ways. God is ruling the affairs of life and he is perfectly capable of orchestrating situations to create a place where his will and your life intersect. I'm not suggesting that you put this at the top of your list, but sometimes God's firm no is that closed door that you simply cannot force open. If you have not surrendered your life to Christ, what's stopping you right now? Why not do it? No more excuses. Don't buy the lie. I need more time. <laughs> and that's your hope to go. What would you do if you witnessed someone drowning? I imagine you would quickly look for a way to save them. You might even jump in the water and pull them to safety. Well, the Bible says we are dead in our sin and separated from God, but God is able to rescue those who are dead and bring them back to life. At 700 Club Canada, we are on a mission to rescue people and bring them to life. Will you partner with us in this rescue mission? If giving monthly isn't your preference, consider a generous annual gift. We'd be so grateful. Call us today at 1-855-759-0700. For our mailing address and to give online, go to 700club.ca. These are desperate times for our nation. Together, we can bring the good news of Jesus. Thank you. Lori, we've been talking this whole program about how to leave lies behind. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're often uh, stronger because we never share them and put light on them. Right. And we don't share them with trusted, seasoned friends. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about those that know the difference between the truth and the lie. Yes. Especially when they hear them. Because it might be hard for me to define the lie in my life. But when I hear you say something, I said, Lord, right. that's not you. Yeah. And that's not God's purpose mm -hmm. for your life. Mm -hmm. And that's why when we shine light on them, they have to break. Absolutely, Brian. I think this is why God, the church is God's idea. Yes. Like following Jesus is not a Lone Ranger right. experience. And I just wanna to speak to you right now that you're thinking, is that me? Maybe I'm living under a lie, I'm not sure. You know, one of the ways and a practice that you can do, and I agree with Brian, it's you need to sit with some trusted people yeah. 
to even help you identify the lies, but if I could just lead you in a simple prayer, and it just goes like this. Father, first of all, I welcome your truth. Yeah. I reject any lie from the world, my own flesh, and the devil himself. Yeah. Cut me off from all of those lies. Silence them. Jesus, what do you say about me? And then I encourage you to listen because the Holy Spirit will come and he will speak to you. What do you say about me? Are you open to receive that? And this is where, through even the help of others, you can hear from God. These are things that God will say to you. You're loved. I love you. You're forgiven. You do not hold shame. You belong to me. You are courageous. That is the voice of God. And that is a way that you can learn to hear the truth from God. Amen. And, and take the word of God as well. We want to get something into your hands. It doesn't cost you anything. It's called overcoming a critical spirit. Because many times when the lie comes in, the reason why we're so critical, because the only power that the enemy of our soul, the accuser of the brethren, Satan himself has, is suggestion. All he can do is continue to suggest. And that's why what you have to do sometimes is shout it out loud, the truth, mm -hmm. because the lie has to leave. Mm -hmm. And whenever he says you're not something, the Bible says you are something. Mm -hmm. When he says you're, you are something, God says you're not that, because he's the father of lies. It says this in John 8, 32, whom the son makes free, and we're gonna pray this for you right now, is free indeed. Mm -hmm. Why don't you pray that? Mm -hmm. Well, Father, we pray for freedom, freedom in the minds and hearts and the belief systems yeah. of people, From that they lies. would only believe what you say about them, Amen. and they would reject all lies in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We agree with that together for the freedom from lies, proclaiming and receiving the truth of what you say in their lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now claim your identity and hold on to this truth as we leave this with you. Romans 15 and 5, it says, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. So that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's some solid truth. Yeah. We love you. Talk to you soon. God bless. To contact us, phone 1-855-759-0700. You can email us at cba at 700club.ca. You can now like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter or Instagram. Tomorrow on the 700 Club Canada. The really thing that encouraged me the most was like getting up out of, out of that hospital bed and be able to do all that stuff. And I go back to that a lot. The doctors told me I shouldn't be able to walk, that, that I should be paralyzed. I just think God was with me the whole time at every race that I run, that God's always with me.